don't have a job Don't pay your bills Won't buy you a home in Beverly Hills Won't fix your life If five easy steps Okay, there's so many ways to get together just by not seeing each other. Uh, so, uh, you could get together by YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any of those. And the best part about at church when I got to see everyone was was doing uh, was seeing like was seeing all of you and being with all the teachers and my sisters is obviously the same so we hope you have a good day of worship peace out thank you for joining us in worship as we celebrate communion please join us in singing Come, share the Lord.
I invite you to join me now in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. We are grateful, O Lord, for your invitation to come and share in your goodness. You welcome us with open arms, and we are grateful for your kindness and love. You bring us together as a family of faith, forgiven at the cross, united at the table. We worship you in a spirit of humility, Father. When we look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, who are we that you are mindful of us? Who are we that you care for us? And yet you do care for us. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We are glad in you. We give thanks to you with all our hearts. Your compassion never ends. Please fold in your compassion, loving God, those who are afflicted with disease, those who are struggling with discouragement. Please grant comfort to the lonely and the grieving. Lay your healing hand upon the wounds of their bodies and their souls, that inner peace may be their portion. Revive their failing strength, and let life conquer death, for you are the way and the truth and the life. We pray for our nation today as well, in this time of division and conflict. Please fill our leaders with your wisdom and guide them in their decisions. Help us to listen with careful consideration to those with different points of view. Empower us to uphold the values of justice, mercy, and righteousness in our words and our actions. We pray for all the firefighters and first responders who are working so hard in this time with so many fires and floods. And we pray for all who have lost homes or loved ones. Most of all, as we come to the table, we pray for the Church of Christ around the world. Please inspire us in truth, unity, and concord, and forgive us for our failures. Grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your word, living in patience, hope, and godly love. As we hear the words of the ancient prophet today, please speak to us with your spirit, bringing your word alive for this time. And we lift our prayers in the name of the living Christ, our Savior and our King, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Thomas, for leading us in prayer today. Prayer is something all of us can do. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, what it does is it, is it connects us not only to each other, but it connects us to the heart of God. I was reminded a long time ago, and uh, it has stuck with me, that prayer may not change our circumstances, but it can change us in the midst of the circumstances we find ourselves. And one of the things I have been missing most during this time is being able to, to pray with people. I've had some of those opportunities, but not as much as I would like. So beginning on October 18th, Pastor Thomas and I will be leading and inviting you to join us for what we're calling the Prayer Connection. It's an intentional time of prayer with one another, and it will be a space where you can share your burdens, where you can share your joys, or maybe it's just holding that space for others in the midst of prayer. 
It will be an online gathering uh, beginning at 11 a.m. every Sunday starting on the 18th. So there's not going to be any need to sign up. So I invite you to watch your, your church email and website and social media for more information. So stay tuned on that. Today we find ourselves in the midst of the Itty Bitty Bible Book series. Actually, we're right now smack dab in the middle of it. In the past two weeks, we explored the books of 2 John and 3 John. And in the next two weeks after this week, we'll be exploring Philemon and Jude. Now, all of these four books are in the New Testament, so it seems appropriate to switch gears a bit and explore the only itty bitty Bible book in the Old Testament, Obadiah. Obadiah is right there squeezed in between Amos and Jonah. And if we've realized anything over the last couple of weeks, it's that there's a lot of great wisdom that we can squeeze out of these small books. And Obadiah is no exception. Now, while 2 John and 3 John, if you remember, they kept pointing us back toward truth and love. But the book of Obadiah seems to focus on something completely opposite seems to focus on punishment, revenge, the annihilation of our enemies. Now, if we were giving movie ratings to these itty-bitty books, the, the last two weeks have probably been PG, maybe a little bit of G, perfectly okay to have the children in the room with you as you watch the movie. But today we have a book that teeters in that gray area between PG-13 and R, depending on how you define those two things. Definitely one where the kids need to be in bed before you start watching it. Now, Obadiah is a prophet, and we really don't know too much about him, only that he was given a vision by God that offered first a word of warning to Edom, but also a word of hope to Israel. So to offer some context, there had been an ongoing feud between the Edomites and the Israelites, and this feud extended all the way back to when their descendants were literally in their mother's womb. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, the Israelites descendants of Jacob. So if you remember, Esau and Jacob were twin brothers, born to Isaac and Rebekah, grandsons of Abraham and Sarah. Esau was the firstborn, with Jacob literally hanging onto his heels as he was born. Their relationship was fraught with conflict almost from the very beginning. Esau was entitled to his father's inheritance, but Jacob tricked his brother into giving him the birthright instead. Now Esau tried to get that birthright back, if you remember the story, but his father did not oblige. And so from that point on, Esau was filled with bitterness, filled with this grudge against Jacob. I think we could probably understand that living in that kind of environment isn't very good with healthy family dynamics. Now, eventually, Jacob's name is changed to Israel after wrestling all night with God, and and his descendants become known, as I mentioned, the Israelites. Esau founded the nation of Edom, and his descendants became known as the Edomites. So this bitterness between these two brothers extended beyond a, a sibling rivalry. And it infected the nations that they created for generations. Now, the bitterness between these two nations, it's chronicled throughout the Old Testament. But it all came to a head after the Israelites had been defeated by the Babylonians and sent into exile. And the neighboring nation of Edom stood by and just watched. Hear these words from Obadiah chapter 1. And I'll be reading today verses 10 through 14. I encourage you to read the whole book, but today I'm just going to be reading verses 10 through 14. This is from the New Living Translation. Because of the violence that you did to your close relatives in Israel, you will be filled with shame and destroyed forever. When they were invaded, you stood aloof, refusing to help them. Foreign invaders carried off their wealth and cast lots to divide up Jerusalem, but you acted like one of Israel's enemies. You should not have gloated when they exiled your relatives to distant lands. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered such misfortune. You should not have spoken arrogantly in that terrible time of trouble. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering such calamity. 
You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have seized their wealth when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads, killing those who tried to escape. You should not have captured the survivors and handed them over in their terrible time of trouble. Now, most of the verses before and after what I just read for you are God also saying how much he is going to punish the Edomites. He's using words such as destroy, slaughter, wipe out. In verses 15 through 16, I'll just kind of paraphrase it a little bit. We hear God say, as you have done to Israel, so it will be done to you. All your evil deeds will fall back on your own heads. All you nations will drink and stagger and disappear from history. Those are some strong, strong words. Makes me remember when I was a kid, we always knew when my dad was mad because his eyes would get real big and they looked like they were popping out of his head. Well, this is God's eye-popping moment. And he didn't mince any words. But what do we do with all of this? It can be so tempting to skip past books like Obadiah that reveal a side of God that's, quite frankly, hard to swallow. It's a side of God that doesn't align with what we know of him in the New Testament, a God of grace, mercy, forgiveness, love. But if we did that, we would miss some great lessons this itty-bitty book and books like it have to offer. And this book has a lot to offer, so much so that I struggled for three days. I actually wrestled with this to figure out what direction God was leading me to go. And while I could spend the rest of this message talking about the pitfalls of pride, or warnings about the punishment of going against God and God's people. That's often what is gleaned from this particular book. It's often, if people ever preach about it, what they typically preach about. But I want to focus on something a little different. I want to focus on something more hopeful. You see, Obadiah's vision was more of a message to the Israelites than to the Edomites. You see, their lives had been turned upside down, and I imagine that they were beginning to wonder if God was really concerned about what was going on with them. I I wonder if they were beginning to think that, that God really didn't care, or if they were really God's holy chosen people. Obadiah's vision, strangely enough, reminded them that they were not alone, that God was not only still with them, but God was still for them. Who among us needs to be reminded of that? In a world that has been turned upside down by a pandemic where economic security for many is shaky at best, where the lack of human touch and connection is leading to spikes in alcohol and drug-related incidents, depression and anxiety, and an increase in suicide. Where our hallowed traditions of of gathering for worship and going to church have shifted to the somewhat impersonal medium of online and Zoom. Where we grieve our losses, but we also fear what's to come next. Our world has been turned upside down by people in power, pitting groups of people one against the other to the point where if someone disagrees with you, we just tend to throw words out there. Words calling them evil or unchristian or stupid or socialist or fascist. Please don't make me go on. We have been turned upside down to the point where we try to fit Jesus into our kingdoms rather than being transformed to be able to live fully into God's kingdom. And in the midst of it all, I know I need to be reminded that God is still with me and that God is still for me, that God is still with us and God is still for us. 
I need to be reminded that what we are going through right now is not the end of our story. It's a part of it, but it's not the end of it. I need to be reminded again and again and again that there is hope and that Jesus is still the King, the one who embodies and shows us what the kingdom looks like. Obadiah's vision paints a picture of God's kingdom in those verses that I read for you a little bit earlier. Now, if you take a look back at those verses, I count that there are eight times when God says to the Edomites, you should not have. So you should not have gloated. You should not have plundered. You should not have spoken arrogantly and so on. Eight times God explains what they did wrong. And if we're not careful, we can get stuck in that space. We can get stuck looking at what they did wrong. But I want to encourage us to look at it a little bit differently today. I want us to see those as statements of God's kingdom. That God's kingdom is a place where you should not have becomes, I'm glad you did. To sum up those verses, could God be saying to us, I'm glad you responded with compassion to the cries of those around you. I'm glad you shared what you had with those who needed it most. I'm glad you stood in solidarity with those who are being persecuted and oppressed and marginalized. I'm glad you did it for the least of these. Could God be showing us what his kingdom looks like? And isn't that who we are called to be as as followers of Jesus? Jesus, the one who said in Matthew 25, 40, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. See, when we live in the values of Jesus, the values of the kingdom, we respond to needs as they arise. We feel compelled to respond. We respond individually, corporately, and systemically. That instead of ignoring the plight of those who are oppressed, instead of looking out for our own needs at the expense of those in most need, instead of demonizing people and groups because their plight makes us uncomfortable, instead of mocking them and diminishing their needs, followers of Jesus respond out of love because they are a part of this human family that God so deeply loves. Do we hear God calling us back to God's way of being and living in the world? Do we strive to be transformed by kingdom of God values? When we as individuals and the church, the body, are transformed, the things that will remain, you know, those things that will not be wiped off the face of the earth, those things that that will not disappear from history, are those acts of love, those moments of doing work of justice, those moments of coming off the sidelines and and being about the work of God's kingdom, those moments of, of creating space that honors the image of God in everyone we meet. It's those things that remain. Robert Louis Stevenson, who's the author of the classic book Treasure Island, spent his childhood in Edinburgh, Scotland in the 19th century. And as a boy, Robert was fascinated by the work of the old lamplighters who who went around with their ladders and their torches, setting the streets ablaze for the night. And one evening, as young Robert was staring out the window in fascination, his parents asked him, Robert, what in the world are you looking at out there? And with great excitement, he exclaimed, look at that man. He's punching holes in the darkness. And that's our task, church. That's our task, to punch holes in the darkness, 
to let our love radiate and shine in this world that is darkened by sin, this world that God loves so much that he is, re- he is willing to remove those things that keep us from seeing his light. And when it seems that God is taking his own sweet time, and when it seems like maybe he has abandoned us, we're reminded through Obadiah that he is still with us. He is still for us because his light is still in us. I close with these words from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. May it be so. Friends, as we come to this time of the Sacrament of Holy Communion, we are reminded that Jesus is with us in the bread and the cup, that they are reminders for us of God's love and grace. So no matter where you are, God's grace extends to you and you are invited to this table. All people are welcome to this table. Nobody is ever turned away. Not even Jesus' betrayer, Judas, was turned away from this table. It's at this table that we are reminded, yes, of our sin and the darkness that is within us. But it's also here that Jesus punches a hole into that darkness and shines his light and love back into our hearts and souls. So we remember. We remember that night that Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room And there was darkness, not only in the night around them, but there was this darkness of fear, of anxiety, of the unknown. So Jesus tries to bring some light into the midst of that darkness, and he takes just some ordinary bread, and he breaks it, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. And every time that you eat of this, as often as you do it, Do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and pouring it out, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink of this cup, know of my mercy, know of my forgiveness and do it in remembrance of me. Whatever darkness that you are experiencing, know that the light of Jesus comes through the bread and through the cup. So friends, I want to invite you to take the bread and the cup that you have with you. And as we listen to this next song, be mindful of how Jesus is shining his light and his love back into your heart and back into your soul. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us for online worship. We were so happy to have you with us. I'm Mindy Davidson, the Director of Business Administration, and if you haven't figured it out, I'm standing at the playground at the church. We've recently welcomed back the Apple Tree students, and we're so happy to have their joy and their laughter with us each and every day. And we're going to bring that joy and laughter back here with you, too, because we're hosting Trick or Trunk. Sunday, October 25th from 4 to 7 p.m. Get those costumes ready because we'll have plenty of candy. Please visit the link on the screen and register for a designated time slot because we're going to make this event fun and safe for everyone. We hope to see you then. Events like Trick or Trunk are made possible due to the generosity of our congregation. Thank you so much for the gifts that you've sent in throughout the summer and during this time. I am very honored to be the staff member that tracks all those that information and gets to take this opportunity to say thank you. If you'd like to make a contribution, please follow the link on the screen, text GIVE to the number on the screen, visit our website, drop off a check, or mail it into the church. At this time, I wish you the ble most blessed week you could have. May God bless you, our church, and our community, and may you see the itty bitty details and fall that God is showing us. Thank you so much. No.